Uh, while this is all happening, um, scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Thank you for that. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Cheers. And we'll start reading from verse 1 in just one moment. Thanks for having me back again. Um, I can't remember what I preached last time. Hopefully it's not the same sermon. So uh, <laughs> if it is, God will speak something. Something. No, it's not the same sermon. I know that for a fact. Um, a, few, a few weeks ago, the, I don't know if you've been following the Ocean Gate Titan tragedy. Um, apparently there was a website where they were counting down how many hours they had to survive. It's the people of the internet, God bless them. Um, and so um, I saw footage on YouTube um, of the actual vessel, because I was fascinated by this. It's actually the size of a minivan, has one portal at the front, and the five people paid 360,000 Aussie for the experience that they actually see on a big screen and get a better view on the screen, but they just want to be down there. And so the question is, the question in my mind is, why would anybody want to pay $360,000 to be stuck in a minivan with a, hot, with a window about this size to have a view of the Titanic? Um, because they do have the money, but um, these people... One article in the uh, Washington Post says, these people are the ones who have scaled the seven peaks, crossed the Atlantic Ocean in their own boat, a beach getaway to the Italian Riviera doesn't do it for them. So what they want to do is they experience the final frontiers. That's why they're willing to pay thousands to go up in space, the final frontier, and also the final frontier on Earth is literally down into the deep. This journey was fraught with danger. The very first page of the paper they had to sign, five times on that first page, you may die. Beware of this. You may die. But these people are seeking thrills, and these thrills have consequences. Now, I set this as a platform for our text today because here is a man... We know him by the name of Paul, Paul the Apostle, who has had the experience of experience. This man was caught up into the third heaven. Now, this is not a drug trip. This is a real thing. This is actual. Paul writes about it here in our text now, this is not my experience. I don't know if it's your experience, but this is not my experience or many others. Just like crossing the Atlantic in your own boat. But for Paul, this experience had consequences. To be caught up into the third heaven, to hear things that it's not lawful, as he says later on, for a man to hear, the consequences were that God gave him a thorn that was given to me, he says, in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me. So let's read about this experience. And I want to talk about lessons of thorns and grace from chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians. It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, whether out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a one was caught to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I do not know, God knows, how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast, except in my infirmities. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will speak the truth. But I refrain, lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of these revelations... 
A thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that might depart from me, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Wow, what a... What a testimony. Here's Paul. He has a unique calling. We know him. He wrote two-thirds of the, word, the New Testament. He began with a dramatic conversion. He is a strict Jew, the Jews of Jews. And he becomes an apostle to the Gentiles. This is a unique calling. This calling began with a vision. He fell off his court, horse. This uh, this journey continues on where he sees, a, in again, a vision of a man called Ananias coming to pray for him to open up his eyes because he was blind for a little season. He saw a vision of a man from Macedonia to redirect his mission from going this way to Asia to come back to Macedonia to preach the gospel. And we read about a vision that he saw in the midst of a storm where he and the crew would be saved and God spoke to him. In a vision that things will happen. God, God speaks to this man in visions. He sees things that people don't see. But these visions are nothing compared, compared to the vision in our text. And he refers to it as a vision that happened 14 years ago. The details are vague. Whether in spirit or in body, he doesn't know. He repeats it twice. But it's undeniable. He says, I saw things. I was caught up in the third heaven. Not atmosphere, not the heavenlies, but the third heaven. The place where God dwells in his glory. He talks about paradise. A real place that he encountered and he had an experience. A place where no man can enter unless God makes a way. And in verse 4 he says, not only did I see things, but I heard things which are not lawful, too glorious for someone to repeat. Now we know about the Jews that they will not even pronounce the name of Jehovah. It's the unpronounceable name. The Jew will not do that because it's too holy to mention God's name. Paul saw things in that place. Divine secrets that were only shared in heaven by God and heavenly beings. This is a unique experience. We read about Moses who met with God on the mountaintop. He spoke face to face with God, the Bible says. But when Moses asked to see God's face, he says, no, you can't do that, Moses. You can only see my backside, otherwise you're going to die. We know Peter, he was in the Mount of Transfiguration. They experienced encounters of a different kind, but Paul was caught in the third heaven. It's a unique encounter. But the unique encounter about this is the first time we hear about it, and Paul writes about it, and in writing about it, it's just in passing to deal with the pride of the Corinthians. He's kept this secret for 14 years. Something God did for him to sustain him in his many dangers, tours, and snares. It is something that Paul experienced personally. It was not something to reveal in public. We discover the hidden source of Paul's strength. You know, he wrote passages like Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. He wrote that in prison. And it wasn't just a little text that he wrote to encourage some people. He really meant it. There's power in Paul's words. 
And this unique calling that Paul had, this unique encounter, was to sustain him in his calling. How many people would like to see heaven? Really? Really, you want to see heaven? Do you know what you're asking? Do you know what you are asking? James and John wanted to sit on the left hand and the right hand of Jesus. And Jesus said, do you know what you guys are asking for? Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or the baptism to which I am baptized with? We don't know what we're asking. We may have seen glimpses of heaven, heard glimpses of heaven. We might encounter little glimpses of what the Spirit of God is. But all we have is glimpses. Paul encountered something unique. I encountered a glimpse of heaven when I got saved, when the first encounter when my sins were forgiven and this quiet confidence. I didn't enter into heaven. I just had this sense that my sins were forgiven. When I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, the power of God came upon me. I, I wasn't entered into the third heaven. Just I knew that something different was happening. I, when I hear the still small voice, when I, when I encountered the word of God, when I'm listening to a sermon, God speaks to me personally when I'm praying and you feel God's prayer. It's not the encounter that Paul had. They're glimpses. They're just little, little lights. When I'm walking in the destiny and the calling and we just know that I'm, I'm in the place where God wants me to be, they're only little glimpses. I have not seen heaven. I want to talk about the um, legacy of the thorn because encounters with God of this kind tends to make people a little bit proud. That's why God doesn't show them to you. That's why Paul writes about it. Talks about, you know, I'm not anything special. When people, have, when people have these kind of encounters in a cave with a book, they have special glasses to read through some things and interpret things in a special way. You know what they do? They start a religion and make money. They're not going to sit there for 14 years in silence. They want to go on the I've seen heaven circuit. They want a book deal. They want a Netflix series, folks. There's, these folks want... And God in his wisdom knows how to bring balance to these sort of encounters. So if you say, I want to see God, I want to see heaven, it's going to be counterbalanced with something else. It's called a thorn. Or otherwise, you're going to become bigger than God. That's the problem with Lucifer. How many know Lucifer was actually in heaven's place? He saw things that Paul had a glimpse of. Lucifer was in that place. He heard, he saw things that it's not lawful for men to hear. And yet this unique being wanted the throne as well. Paul's great vision was given to him to counterbalance the thorns and the thistles and the toils and the snares he was going to encounter as the apostle to the Gentiles. He saw something. We get glimpses. He saw something. And to keep him from being swallowed up with pride, he was given a thorn. Verse 7, this thorn is not just a little pinprick, oh, a little inconvenience. This thorn is a sharp stake used for torturing or impaling prisoners. We're talking about excruciating pain. It's symbolic of the pain of the affliction in life. Now, there's much speculation about this thorn. Many people think it was like a disease or an eye condition. Many commentators think it was a demonic assault, critics or uh, dif different things that he had to face. But the fact of the matter is, it, we can summarize it that Paul had some difficulties in life. 
difficulties that will absolutely crush every single one of us. All we know is it's a messenger of Satan, which brought him 14 years of pain, distress, and suffering. Paul writes about persecutions, needs, and reproaches. This is not something that we welcome. You know, when Satan sends you a message, it's not really good news. I've got a message for you. It's glad tidings for all men. No, it's not, it's not that at all. Usually involves sickness. Usually involves the things we are praying about for this morning. Usually involves depression, mental anguish, poverty, hardship, death. The things that we pray against this morning. The things that we pray against are messengers of Satan to these individuals. I was in school the other last week and one of my year eight students is a son of a teacher, a friend of mine. And I just saw him just sitting there just quietly and uh, I've got a bit of a relationship with him. And just a you know, year eight kid, 13-year-old kid. And he was just sitting there. I said, well, what's wrong? Did you just feel, feel down a bit? And just, he, he's suffering from depression as a 13-year-old. And we're praying through that. I'm seeing, you know, I'm seeing something. He's, he's got an, a message from Satan. And we discover this thorny legacy in the Word of God, read it right from the very, very beginning. In the garden, the paradise, where all is good, where, where the Scripture says it's all very good, there's one tree causing a lot of angst to eat or not to eat. It's a thorn. It's a similar thorn in our own lives. There are thousands of options and the things that we can do. How many, how many times we focus on the thing, the one thing that we do not, and we just, we just need to obey God, but it's this thing that's causing a thorn, it's causing angst. What's the thing that I can't do? In Abraham's life, in the midst of the promise of his seed, and he'll see many, many stars, there's a thorn of barrenness. Many years go past where he doesn't see any promise. There's a thorn. God says, you're going to be a, a father to the nations. You're going to have a, a, a multitude, and there's nothing there. There's a thorn of barrenness. Digging into him to the point where the option of Hagar is given him. Yeah, I'll take that. I was reading about Hannah the other week in the midst of this great marriage with her husband. Says, aren't I better than ten sons? She was loved by the husband and yet... She has this thorn of barrenness where the Bible says the Lord closed her womb. The Lord closed her womb, causing this angst and this pain. We all know about Job, don't we? Righteous Job. Before God, Satan says, let me have him. And God says, you can do whatever you want with him, just don't kill him. Now there's a message <laughs> that he's going to deliver to this guy. Afflicted him with sickness and loss beyond compare. Where this man questioned God and his own suffering. Does this sound familiar? Does this sound familiar that you're given a promise? You, God's spoken to you. God, you've seen some things and yet there is this thorn, there is this thing that's, that's jabbing into you. What about Jacob and Peter? Jacob in the Old Testament turned into Israel. Simon who turns to, to Peter in the New Testament. These are men of God. The thorn of their weakness in their own characters. How many people struggle with the weakness of their own character? You wake up every single morning and you look yourself in the mirror. It's me again. I have to deal with me again. Remember Peter, the one that says, I will never leave you or forsake you. And Jesus is before the cock crows. You'll deny me three times. Guess what? Well, every time the cock crows, which is usually every morning in a rural community, Peter is reminded of his failure. Peter is reminded of who he is before God. What about Jesus himself, the Son of God, who shared the glory of creation in heaven? You know what he did? He took the thorn of humanity. 
The perfect God took the thorn of humanity to suffer, the Bible says, in all points as we are, yet without sin. All the things that you encounter, all the thorns, the pains, the distresses, the anguish, Jesus suffered in all points, but without sin, without compromise. The thought of rejection from his own, the thorn of the cross, to take away the cup, he prayed to take away the cup, the thorn of rejection from his father, not to mention the crown of thorns upon his head. It was a painful reminder of the rejection of men and God's face. Paul was given a thorn to keep him humble. Paul prayed three times to remove these thorns because we do not like thorns. I do not like thorns. Please change my poverty to wealth. Please change this sickness to health. Please change these reproaches to justice. Please change this barrenness to fruitfulness. Lord, please change this painful suffering into joy. But when we pray, as Paul prayed, as Jesus prayed to remove the thorn, and the thorn is still there, what do we do? What do we do? Do we just grit and endure? Do we blame God? Do we give up? Do we give in to the pressure? Do we compromise? Do we seek revenge? Is there, is there another solution? No, there isn't, so let's go home. Yes, there is. That was a preacher joke. <laughs> yes, there is. There's always a third, there should always be a third point to a sermon. I want to talk about the sufficiency of grace. And this is the lesson that Paul learned, the greatest lesson that he learned in life is grace. Coming back to the Titan, Titan tragedy, um, they, they found the pieces and basically the whole tragedy was that it was going deep and the, the, the danger was is that the pressure of the ocean, that's why you need special vehicles down there, it imploded under the pressure of the water. It's just like instantaneous. And you see pictures, like if you look on YouTube, there's like containers, like petrol containers, that uh, the pressure on the outside is greater than the pressure inside. The whole thing just collapses immediately. It just like, takes an instant. Nanosecond. And to deal with that kind of pressure, you need special vehicles. <laughs> this vehicle, this, this, this Titan, was made out of carbon fiber. Who, who does that? You need walls about yay thick to deal with the pressure of the water. Now, here's the interesting thing, right? This vessel could have avoided the tragedy if it was built correctly. But down that level, and you look, you look at uh, YouTube, there's species of fish swimming at the bottom of the ocean quite happily. Now, there's this man-made contraption, right? And there's this fish going past. Like, there's no armor. There's no thick walls of steel to stop this fish collapsing under its own pressure. There's fish swimming quite happily. Creatures living under there. Like, thousands of meters down the bottom. Pressure's a thousand times greater than the surface. I was intrigued, so I, why do fish survive under intense pressures? Apparently, it's to do with one little chemical. Let me see if I can pronounce it correctly. It's called trimethylamine oxide. Trimethylamine oxide, abbreviated to TMAO. TMAO prevents the distortion of proteins and other vital molecules under intense pressure. So there's this little drug inside these fish stops the proteins and all the things that cause it to be alive to, to, uh, to, to stop 
being crushed under the intense pressure. In other words, there's something from within the fish to counter the intense pressure that's without. I'll say it again. There's something inside the fish that counters the intense pressure that's without. God's message to Paul, using this crude illustration, is that my grace inside of you is sufficient to counter the pressures that life brings. In other words, grace is the TMAO when pressure is intense. No matter how much pressure you encounter, there is enough TMAO to counter that pressure to stop you getting crushed under that pressure. That grace, God says to Paul, is sufficient. The answer to the pain and suffering is not removal, but transformation. It's the transformation of that grace. Jesus in the garden when he prayed, remove the cup, remove the thorns, take this. This is Jesus praying. Take this away. But he needed something that what the Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 12 says, for the joy that was set before him, Jesus endured the cross. There was something inside of him that says, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. How many understand that you know, Paul had intense pressures? You read about them. You know the, the intense pressure, shipwrecks, toils, uh, starvation, being persecuted. I mean, there's a whole list. You know, we've heard that list, haven't we? And then the, and the care of all the churches, daily care of all the churches. There is an intense pressure in Paul's life. In Jesus, he's carrying the pressure and the intensity of the world's sin upon his shoulders. Jesus went to depths that no human being can survive. The Bible says Jesus went to the depths of hell <coughs> to redeem us. But you know what? Even down in hell, there was a compensating grace to overcome. The fact is, without the incarnation, God emptying himself, without the crown of thorns on his head, without death, the bloodshed, we would still be in our sins. We would still be in torment. Messengers of Satan will be tormenting us today. And the reason why we can pray, the reason why we can pray in confidence in Jesus' name is that we know that Jesus did something for us. If Jesus' prayer was answered that day to take away the cup of suffering, there will be no grace. No grace released. There will be nothing for us on the inside to combat the pressures from the outside would still be in our sins. Paul's revelation that God's grace is perfected in suffering. God's grace is perfected in intense pressure. In the same way it was perfected in Christ, that grace can be perfected in you and I. No matter how deep you go, no matter how much pressure Life gets, there's enough T-M-A-O, there's enough grace to compensate that pressure, to enable to survive in that environment. My strength, verse 9 says, Paul says, my strength is perfected in weakness. How many, how many know, you know we expect strong people to be strong? When, when a strong person is strong, yeah, that's right, because they're strong. We expect them to deal with that pressure. But when a weak person exhibits strength, when someone you don't expect to exhibit strength, then there's something going on. Just like the fish at the bottom of the sea, why is that fish swimming around when it should be crushed under thousands of atmospheres of pressure? There's something going on on the inside. Something supernatural is happening. What made Christ strong as a human being is the decision to become weak. God coming down the form of a human being. What made Christ strong as a human is the decision to become weak and vulnerable. Vulnerable to his Father's will rather than fight Satan, the world, and the flesh on his own. 
<coughs> it was D.T. Forsyth had this quote. It says, far better to pray for a transformation of pain and suffering rather for that removal. I'll read that again. It's far better to pray for the transformation of pain and suffering rather than its removal. In verse 10, Paul's view of the thorn now is not something to be removed. Just keep praying, keep praying until it's gone. Paul's view of the thorn now is a gift, not an enemy. It's a means of transformation. We're not talking about a mentally unhinged man here. He prefers the pain to the, ple- to the pleasure. We're talking about someone that has, has a revelation. When he boasts of his infirmity and his weakness, he acknowledges the means where grace may become available. Corinth boasted in its pride and its strength. This is who we are. We're strong. We're, we, we can do things. We have gifts. Paul says, no, 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 no. He's using this little illustration to say, when I'm weak, then I am strong. So the legacy of the thorn is also accompanied by a deep surrender of God's perfect plan. Not only for Paul and for Jesus. Remember Abraham? God says you'll be fruitful. He believed God in that time when the thorn was acting on his life for at least a quarter of a quarter of a century, 25 years. He believed God when his body was dead and was willing to sacrifice his own son. Why? Because the grace was sufficient to deal with something that you and I would think, what, sacrifice my own son to prove my love for God? No, there was a sufficient grace to be able to do that. That's why he became the father of faith. Hannah, in her own personal encounter, the messenger of Satan in the form of the other woman, Penina, causing anguish in her soul, resulted in deep prayer and surrender of her firstborn whom we know as Samuel, one of the greatest prophets. Samuel was birthed as a, out of intense grief and pain. God, it's not like take this away, but God, bless me, and whatever comes out of my womb, I'll offer him back to you. Ludwig van Beethoven, one of my favorite composers, you recognize him from his motif. Ba, 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 bum. That motif was basically the foundation of this fifth symphony. You'll hear it right throughout the whole symphony. It's, it's what makes, you know, he doesn't write tunes. La, 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 la. He writes motifs. Ba, 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 bum. Ba, 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 bum. Ba, 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 bum. Bum, bum. Ba, 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 bum. That thing appears right through that motif. Appears. That's how Germans write. They write in motives. The Italians write in opera style and singing. It's more showy. That that motive appears in many composers' uh, compositions. Shostakovich, because these these are people that are tormented in soul and they write, express themselves in music, became as the fate motive or fate knocking at the door. Do 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 do. And for Beethoven, the fate was he's experiencing the first signs of deafness. That was the fifth symphony. By the ninth symphony, he's stone deaf. He's hearing the music in here. And yet he writes, you know, the ninth symphony, Ode to Joy. Da, 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 da. Very, very different. The Ode to Joy. When he's stone deaf as a composer. How many know? Composers need to hear things. <laughs> That's number one description for a composer. You need to hear things. <laughs> That's your right. For Beethoven, he was, not he-, he was hearing things on the inside. And the very thorn that's designed to crush him as a composer and destroy him became the very creative force that produced music of his last period, the Ninth Symphony, the last quartets, the last piano sonatas, some fantastic music that was not like the music of his generation that prepared the, 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 the foundation for the romantic era, for the next level of composers. And actually, Beethoven says, I'm not writing for this generation, I'm writing for future generations. Because he heard something on the inside. You know, in my life, my, my life, 
64 years of life. I've had thorns. I've had thorns of things happen to my life, and I can tell you of things that happened to me. You know, 16 years ago, there was a thorn of unfair dismissal, unfair dis betrayal by the organization that I loved and I gave my life to. It's like, what? What is what? You guys can't do this. You're Christians. And yet, it's like, what? It's illegal. You can't do this. I sunk, sunk myself and my family to the depths of despair. You give yourself to something for 20 years you believe is going to bring some rewards and they they plunge into the depths of despair. It was instrumental into like, like crushing me. To like, but you know what? That was instrumental in me discovering a second wind of the Spirit at 64. The reason why I'm standing here preaching this to you is because there's some TMAO on the inside because it could have crushed me, man. Like it did a lot of my friends. I don't believe, who is this guy? A lot of my friends who are in the ministry just no longer believe God. They believe the next best thing, money. Money's going to save them. No, it's not. And for me, I'm standing here preaching to you because of some TMAO. The reason why I'm at Swan Christian College as a math teacher, still preach, still excited about winning people to Christ is because of some Tim A.O. And I can tell you this morning with all confidence, like my little meager confidence, is that God's grace, God's grace is sufficient to whatever pressure, whatever depths Satan wants to bring you in and crush you. He won't because there's something on the inside that will cause you to swim. Let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes in the presence of God. Hallelujah. I prayed three times for this thorn to be removed. That's what we do, don't we? God, take away the pain. Take away the suffering. God, change, change this. But you know what? Can we just... When you're in that pressure situation, like Paul, like Jesus, please take this cup away. God can use that to transform you into a powerful vessel and a messenger of the kingdom. When the messenger of Satan comes to accuse you, every morning maybe there's, there's a trigger point of, Oh, it's me again and my sins. Oh, I have to deal with this habit again. I have to deal with this again. Why don't you just say, God, take this weakness and transform it and do something in me that I can boast that in my weakness you have revealed your strength. That when people see you, they'll see something supernatural happening. People expect the strong to be strong when they see you transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's like, it's like seeing fish at the bottom of the sea. They shouldn't be doing it, but th they are. And that secret ingredient is accessible to every single one of us. Every single one of you, whatever pressure, whatever depths you're in today. Some of you are experiencing depths. It's pressure. trying to crush your life, trying to crush your faith out. Can you, let, can you let God's grace, real, tangible, available, amazing grace, unmerited favor, allow that to minister to you and transform you, saying, well, how did that happen? The very thing that was intended to crush me is actually the very thing that's transforming to be the person that I am. I'm speaking from experience. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for this congregation. I thank you for the awesome people that are here. You know their stories. You know where they came from. You know where, they, where they're going. And I just pray right now as they prayed 
for the thorns to be removed, for the cups to be removed. I just pray right now, by your grace, that the words that I've spoken this morning from this text, from Paul's life, from Jesus' life, from my own life, that they will resolve to, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. That will just resolve that. God, whatever, whatever it takes. And maybe they have not seen a vision of heaven, but they've tasted it. We've all tasted something. We've all had a glimpse. That's why we're here today. And I just pray that you'll transform them by the power of your Holy Spirit to be powerful testimonies, powerful vessels of your gospel. And the whole reason why we're still here is to bear witness of your kingdom. That's the whole reason why the church exists. It's not about us and our blessings and, you know, retiring well. It's not about that. It's all about what happens now until you finally bring this whole thing to a glorious conclusion. God, let us be the church. Let these people here be the church in their homes, in their families, in their workplaces, on the streets and the highways and the byways, inviting people to this ark of salvation. I just pray right now that you will empower them by the power of your Holy Spirit. The words they speak as a result of these encounters that were intended to crush them, that people see there's something else operating on the inside. Father, I pray that you'll do this by your grace. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you.